Hello, you are listening to Just Films and That. This is the podcast where we talk about films we think might be underrated or underseen. I'm the host, Josh Hallam, and I'm joined, as ever, by my wonderful co-host, Alice Oliver. It was her turn to pick this week, and she chose Inside Lewin Davis from 2013. So, let's get stuck in. Please, Alice Oliver. Oh, my Whoa-oh. gosh. <gasps> I love it so much. I oh, love it Alice. so much. It's a big it one this week. This Adam Driver doing that. Oh. I couldn't have. I couldn't have written anything a more pre, excellent. A pre-attractive, but also maybe attractive. The handsomest, maybe not handsomest man in Hollywood. Yeah, and I mean, sometimes yeah. you're like, you are so handsome. And other times you're like, you're not that handsome. But anyway, I, you know, not to fawn over Adam Driver. So inside Lewin Davis, then from 2013. So spoiler warners if you've not seen this. Um, Absolutely intrigued by this one, Alice, because I, okay. I how uh, how this can fit the brief, I'm intrigued to know. Mm-hmm. So give it to me. Tell the people at home a little bit about what Inside Lewin Davis is about, and then why did you pick it? Right then, so Inside Lewin Davis is a period black comedy drama that is somewhat inspired by real events from the Coen brothers. So it's set in 1961 and follows a week in the life of Lewin Davis, played by Oscar Isaac. He's a folk singer struggling to achieve musical success while keeping his life in order following the death of his musical partner. As well as this, he seems to be homeless and gets through by sofa surfing with friends and family. However, his personality is at times difficult to digest as he is short-tempered and insensitive. So he burns a lot of his bridges and he gets a spoken for woman pregnant and has to pay for the abortion. The film concludes with an unknown musician at the time called Bob Dylan taking the stage at one of Lewin's regular venues. And the final scene is the same as the very first scene of the film, suggesting to the audience that in the week that we've been following Lewin, nothing has changed and he hasn't got anywhere. That is what the film is about. Why did I pick it? Well, why? I f- so from what I've read around it, a lot of people, a lot of kind of, you know, film articulate people mm. feel like this is one of the most underrated Coen Brothers films right. that there is and that it's one of the most underrated performances by Oscar Isaac. And a lot of people feel that it just kind of, it just flew under the radar. Right. Now, if you do, if you look critically, the scores aren't that bad, but I just don't think that this film gets spoken about in the same way that a lot of their other stuff does. Or the Coen Brothers of, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, and because the genre is quite, maybe, not unusual, but the story itself, it's not, I don't know, it's not very Hollywood, is it? It's not very exciting. It's, it's very low-key, isn't it? It's, it's very it's, low-key. Yeah. And I think people enough people didn't get excited about it. And so it just doesn't really, it just kind of got left behind, I feel. Mm. So I think it's a little bit underrated in that regard. And I kind of just wanted to talk about it. That's fine. So I'd, <laughs> I'd only seen this film once. And okay. I remember at the time thinking, oh, I really enjoyed that. And then when I started thinking about it again now, having done this now for some time, I was like, oh, I bet if I went back and watched it with my podcast eyes, with my more critical eyes, that I'd find so much in there Stuff that would just about. be fascinating. Yeah. yeah. And I did. So oh, I was good. right. Good. So there good. we go. Um, so I know you have seen this one yes, before. I have indeed seen this one before. So, so, so I've seen this one before. I've enjoyed it before. This is our first Coen Brothers film, I believe. Uh, oh, yeah, probably because first not one many of them are very to... underrated, right? So. True, and also it's definitely the first one that they've directed. They might have been involved in other ones. But yeah, oh, yes, true, I've seen yeah. this before. I've enjoyed it. So back in the in the, in the the glory days of 2020, before you even came on board our little mm. podcast, um, I had to self-isolate. Uh, my partner got, it was before the first lockdown, so it was when mm. it was, you know, if you've got these symptoms, just do this. Yeah. Um, before work from home became very, very widespread. So, you know, if you weren't already working from home, as in before it became this big, big thing, I had to self-isolate and I had no way of working. So I literally just sat at home for two weeks, not being able to leave a flat that mm-hmm. I lived in at the time. So what I did was I I decided to watch a film each day or 10 films or something like that that, that were meant to be big films that I'd not seen before. So I did like, for example, I did um, Citizen Kane. I'd never seen Citizen mm-hmm. Kane before. I think I did Grease because I don't think I'd ever watched the film version of Grease. I'd seen it on stage. And I did like, I did E.T. I don't think I'd ever watched mm-hmm. E.T. before. Oh, wow. And I also did Inside Lewin Davis. Mm-hmm. So I'll dig out the link and I'll put it in the in the description for this if it's still around but basically i did a thing called josh's self self film salation 
Mm. See what I did there? It's like clever pun smart, on the word. Smart. Yeah, cheers. Good. Genius, um, so genius. this is one of the films I've talked about, uh, and I haven't um, haven't watched it since, but I do mm. remember really enjoying it. I think it was actually the first one that I uh, did for all of them. I can't really? remember why I picked it. It might have been because it was a Coen Brothers film that I hadn't yeah. seen, or because it just was was one I hadn't seen before. So maybe that already says it's underseen, um, but who knows? Um, anyway, let's get stuck into it because you picked this one. So tell us a little bit about what you like. Tell, tell us what you liked about it because you obviously got stuff to say. So let's let's hear it. So I liked. There was just so much. There was just so much, and there there wouldn't be time to go through everything I liked. So a, a couple of points into this, Josh, I just kind of I hone in on one point and just really dig it up. Okay. Like as much as I can, right? Because as I was watching it, I felt like I was just having so many thoughts and so many feelings. So we'll start with the obvious though, right? I'm sure it'll come as no surprise to you, Josh, and the listeners that I love music in a film. I love films about music. I love films with lots of music in them. And I especially love it when music has been designed around a film and relates to or is indicative of either the characters, the story or the world in general or whatever. And you have got some really beautiful music in here, right? And Lewin Davis, I think, is a wonderful singer and I genuinely loved listening to him sing. There is one song in particular that stands out from all of them for me, and that is, of course, Please Mr. Kennedy. And you treat us to, to a little bit of what? that at the oh. beginning. Oh, it's just, I couldn't believe it. When I, when I saw it, I was like, this is hilarious. Because it's not only funny and upbeat and completely absurd, but you've got Adam Driver there adding these sound effects because he plays another musician in the world who records this song with Lewin and then Justin Timberlake's character, Jim. And it was just such a moment for me. Like in terms of brilliant cinematic moments, the whole thing kind of being pieced together was hilarious. It was absurd but kind of there's these undertones of darkness as well at the same time, because Lewin is obviously so desperate, like he's so desperate for cash. He's only there because he needs to be. So putting those two kind of feelings and those two sort of ideas together, just really, it just did something to me, Josh. I just loved it. <laughs> and then bouncing off from this, I love the way that the music is used in the film. So there's no score or soundtrack in the traditional sense. And every song in this film is either partly or fully diegetic. And what I mean by partly is that there is one instance where Lewin C starts playing a record and we're listening to that record as he is, but then he leaves the house and goes about his day. So obviously in that instance, it isn't fully diegetic because he isn't near the record player anymore, but it did start out that way. And doing it this way just feels really immersive. It adds some authenticity to the film. And it means that the film really does, I, I was trying to, struggling as a way to kind of phrase this, but like it feels like a whole and it feels like things are just consistent throughout and that everything matches. Does that mm. make sense? Do you it know does, what I mean? It does. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it's, it's a very, very well constructed film. So everything yeah. from the script to the performances, to the way it looks, to the way it sounds, it feels like you're looking at if someone was to put a feeling into a snow globe. Mm. like that and the film was this is the film this is what we're going for it's it's stylized in such a way but because it's the coen brothers what they're really good at is it's stylized but it's subtle mm -hmm. so it's not like you know the matrix or something like that which is a very very good film but it's very much like look at this, this this is the style we're going for so this is what it is it's in your face whereas this is it sort of feels like the real world mm, yeah yeah but it's sort of also not at the mm -hmm. same time. So it's that feeling I always think of. I always, this sounds really wacky, but I always think of films like this as little snow globes. Yeah, yeah. And if you really want to feel that feeling, you could pick it up off the bookshelf and be like, oh, look, it's a snowy Christmas market or mm -hmm. you know, whatever, whatever it is. And that's, you know, the aesthetic of it and everything like that is, you know, the way it looks, loads of browns and beiges mm -hmm. and it almost feels like a sepia photograph. So I believe that, feel of it was taken from one of the Bob Dylan albums, but I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but it's the one where he's just walking down the street in a sort of tan jacket sort of thing. Right. Um, you'll know the album cover. It's the sort of, yeah, it's probably, one of the ones yeah. you'd know and you go, oh yeah, that, that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, to the way it sounds, like you say, the music and it's brilliant, even though I think most of the songs in it are established folk songs. Mm. Um, I don't know if the Please Mr. Kennedy is, but, um, what? but you know. Oh. What? Oh. Uh, mm. So, yes, I know exactly what you mean about the feel and the sound of the film. Yeah, good. Okay. Glad we're in agreement with that. <laughs> what <laughs> um, else? What else? What else? Well, anyone obviously who's familiar with Coen Brothers will know that they have some excellent skill 
when it comes to script writing. And that is very much the case with this one. So the script itself, in terms of like the dialogue between the characters and how the characters have been designed, each with their own little quirks and funny one-liners and rich backstory, like the young man in the army or the communist who I think he's like part of the Navy recruitment team, but mm. also how the story is told and developed, how certain lines are delivered and how certain scenarios play out and so on and so forth. It's all just pretty excellent and there's so much like little bits of attention to detail that have gone in there. Th these were some of the richest side characters I think mm. I've possibly ever seen in any film. Like everyone had such depth and that was conveyed with literally like a line or two of dialogue or even just a word with that communist one. He just yeah. says... <laughs> or like um, Garrett Hedlund's character who barely says anything. Which, which is, John, is it Johnny Five? John Goodman's driver. Is it Johnny oh, Five? Oh gosh, yeah. He just yeah, says yeah. he says about three things. Yeah, yeah. And he just feels so much. You get so yeah. much from it, don't you? But it, but this is the thing with the Coen Brothers. Is what they're really good at is that is that that the realistically unrealistic. Yeah. So you've met people like that, but at the same time, he doesn't feel quite real. They feel like a like a stereotypical normal person but then mm -hmm. do you know what i mean it's they're, they're very good at putting the two things side by side so they're very good at because i like the coen brothers in general i think mm -hmm. th they can be hit and miss you know I, I love this i love um uh big lebowski and stuff like that but then i've also found other ones to just be just not quite hit me right you mm -hmm. know like i've never really got on board with burn after reading I've tried to. I've oh, watched yeah. it a couple of times and always been like, yeah, it's fine. Well, on the other hand, yeah. one which is quite underseen, which I might add to my list, is Hail Caesar, which I do mm -hmm. really like. If you've not seen that one, you'd probably really like that one as well. But what I think they're really good at in general is, and I've, I've written this down, it's the it's the extraordinary ordinary. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's extraordinary people being ordinary or it's intrigue, intrigue in the mundane wrapped up but everything is it's so mundane it's so nihilistic but at the same time it's existential mm -hmm. so the whole thing about about lewin in this is you know he's he's desperate to make it as a musician and then at one point he's he, he sort of stops and is like why am i desperate to make it as a musician mm -hmm. and it's that interesting thing of they do a lot of interesting things with with purpose and meaning mm -hmm. and cause and effect and that sort of thing do you know what i mean yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I love that what you said about finding intrigue in the mundane. Yeah, and like it's almost so mundane that then it becomes intriguing. Like the interesting, boring. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is definitely the vibe here. There always feels like as well that there's something more to what we're seeing or hearing, and it's always just so enjoyable to learn about the characters and their lives in a way that doesn't require like lines and lines of exposition dumping. And taking all that into consideration, I would like to discuss Lewin as a character and why I think this film is so compelling. So there is a lot going on with him, right? For someone who is completely reliant on the kindness of his friends and family to keep him alive, he comes across as incredibly ungrateful, entitled, he's insensitive, and at times just overtly rude. Oh, he's a he prick. also he, he well, I was I try to try to sort of be sympathetic a little bit as well. It's one of the, it's one of, sorry sorry to interrupt. It's one of the things I always like about this, which is we talked before about me saying I like to like my characters. Sure, this yeah. is a great example of I don't have to like him. He's a prick. Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. a selfish, ungrateful arsehole. Mm -hmm. Um, and and but but it works in the film. Sorry, as you were saying, Lewin as a character. Sorry. Yeah, so and uh, so he also contradicts himself with certain things a lot as well. So at times he talks about music as if it's his spiritual calling, like he couldn't possibly do, do anything else, like it's in his blood, and that career musicians are just empty and chasing the money. Yet when asked to play a song in an intimate setting for the people who are letting him sleep in their house, he seems to become irate that they would even ask that music is just his job, that mm. he only does it to get by. He says that he only does it to pay his rent. And I was like, what rent, mate? You ain't got a home. So just kind of little things like that that would come out of him. Also, he seems so utterly desperate to succeed as a musician. At times you feel convinced as the audience that he would do anything to make it. And yet, when his friends try to secure gigs for him, he becomes flippant. And then when that one venue manager or he's a record label manager or something in Chicago, he offers him the opportunity to actually become something and join two other people to gain regular work and play and sing as part of a trio but he looks like he'd rather stick a fork in his eye and won't accept the offer, even if it could mean that maybe he gains some notoriety as a trio and then eventually later goes solo in his career. But he just can't see the potential in the opportunity put in front of him or he doesn't want to. 
almost as though he is just completely fine wallowing in his failures, that he's comfortable there in his misery and that he just wants to be angry at the world. But there are a few things to consider here, which is why I'm a tad reluctant to just call him a prick <laughs> as you are, Josh. So his I'll friend say, I'll is say dead. It as I say it. <laughs> as you do, you do. It, it, Lewin, Lewin Davis is a prick. There you go. <laughs> I said it. Go on. Go on. <laughs> he said it. Ladies and gentlemen. You'd be, uh, you be slightly more in, intelligent, <laughs> emotionally intelligent than me. <laughs> well, his friend is dead. So his musical yeah. partner, who could have well been his best friend, killed himself, I believe, is what happened in the story. Yeah, so, he went to throw himself off one of the bridges, isn't he? Exactly. So I imagine he is in a state of grief and he hasn't processed what has happened to him in a healthy way. And that's why his feelings seem to come out with some odd behavior. And we've also got this fixation with the cat. So when he's staying at his friend's house, their cat accidentally gets out and heads for the streets of New York. And Lewin is absolutely determined to get it back and then return it safely to its owners. It is the most care and the most kindness that he shows in this film. And I wonder if it's because it sort of acts as a bit of a distraction for a bit, that it gives him a sense of purpose that he has to find and look after this cat, or that the situation feels like one of the few things in his life that he might be able to control. And then later on in the film, when he's driving back from Chicago, he hits what is either like a fox or it could be a coyote or something with the car. And for a moment, he seems quite upset by this. So it's just interesting that he seems to be showing some humanity and empathy in these moments, even though for most of the film, he is quite unlikable. But people are complex and often they don't make sense and are walking contradictions. So it just kind of makes him feel so real because of that. Because our hero is so different. It's so difficult to be on his side. When that guy in Chicago is saying to him, you can come and work in a tree. I've got two people, you'd be perfect. And he's just like, no. And then decides, oh, actually, I'd rather go and join the Merchant Navy or whatever it is he does. And you just think, what? Like, you just want to give him a slap, don't you? That just bit like, always... wake up, Lewin. That bit, so I've seen this film a couple of times now, and I always forget that he's been in the Navy. Mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. because it's such a surprising character trait. i'm not saying this might be me having an, a stereotypical idea of someone who's been in the navy especially because of the time it's set there would have been quite probably a few people coming in and out of the army because it was a way to get solid work and a mm -hmm. solid paycheck and stuff like that but i i'm always like every time they say about going back in the navy i'm, I'm always like oh yeah it's been in the navy mm. <laughs> like it's so it just seems so out of character for him but then that's what's interesting about it is he's such a deeply flawed character but you also can't help but almost root for him mm -hmm. like he's sort of down on his look like you say with the with the cat with the the whole idea of well he, he just wants that feeling of doing something right yeah and also like you say it's the only time he does something for other people because he's getting the cat mm. for for the people who are letting him stay because it's the gore mm. cat isn't it even with the way he is with Kerry Mulligan's character. He's, mm. he's just, it's like it keeps happening to him and he's sort of a little bit emotionally dead to the matters of of, the, of people, but the matters mm -hmm. of a cat or the matters of animals are different, which, you know, is very much a trait in people sometimes. Sometimes people seem more, have more emotional attachment to animals than they do to, than they do to, to, to people. So maybe that's, maybe there's something to that, but yeah, it's, it's, it's such an interesting film. I mean, you could, you could write, you could write essays and books on Coen brothers films and you could dedicate large chunks of it to, to this film. Definitely. Mm. Was there anything else for you then? What did you like about this? <clears throat> um, a lot of it we've sort of covered, like you say, the soundtrack to, uh, and, and that idea of, there's some interesting ideas in it. So most of it already touched on the idea of the contradictory nature of wanting to be an artist, but also needing to live. So having to mm. feel like you're this authentic artist, but not wanting to sell out and take the paycheck for the, for the please, Mr. Pa please, Mr. Kennedy record or whatever, you know, that idea of, I want to make authentic music that's against the man, but in order to live and survive, I have to sort of be part of the machine and take the money from the man at points. Mm -hmm. That contradictory nature again of, you know, of, of most things are manufactured and authentic and genuine things in things like the music industry or the film industry, whatever it may be, are so, so hard to find. Um, I, I, one thing I think just to finish for me, I, I, very much resonate with the feeling of the film, that idea of of wanting something, but feeling like you've almost forgotten why you want it. Mm -hmm. And now what you don't know anymore is, do you just want it because you think it's what you've always wanted? Um, or or um, 
or is it do you actually want that thing and feeling a little bit sort of lost whether that be emotionally creatively anything you know for example I, i've touched on this before and um, not this isn't going to cover any dark stuff or anything like that but if you're not in the mood for listening to sort of um someone rattle on about their mental health there's, there's a lot of that out there uh, or anything like that but for years and years <clears throat> i wanted to be an actor and before yeah. and after that i sort of zoned in on something as i wanted to be a comedian and i did stand up for a long time to the, um for quite a few years and and my nerves were always really, really bad um, to the point where it was sort of ruined. It was taking the edge on for me. And what I was mm. actually looking forward to is the bit where I'd finished the gig and that relief of finishing it to the point where my, my partner said to me, do you, do you want to be a comedian or do you just like, is it just something you thought you wanted to do? And I said to her, I think, I'm not sure. I was feeling a little bit lost at the time. I was only, you know, it was 10 years ago. So, so I was 22 or something like that. And just got not long out of university, needed to, to do a bit of life living and, and that sort of thing. And I remember saying to her, you know, I'll take a bit of time off from comedy, not from everything. So, so I, I didn't do any gigs. I said, I won't take any gigs. I had some booked in. I said, after this day, I won't take any for, I can't remember. It was a couple of months and I never missed it. Mm. And I never went back to it. And it always made me, that's what made me go maybe this isn't for me and i obviously had friends who were comics and we've had plenty of comics come on this and we've always mentioned that i've done comedy and stuff like that and, and uh, but i've never gone into it I've, I've, i'd be interested to talk to it in a more long form way but anyway so that idea of feeling lost i very much resonate with because because it took me a long time to find my way and find my feet with that feeling of of do you want something or do you just want to want something? And actually mm. sometimes it's okay to say, I don't, you know, you don't have to dream big all the time. Sometimes it's, it's actually more about chasing the happiness rather than chasing whatever it is you're chasing. Does that make sense? Yeah. hundred percent. But anyway, so that re I resonate with that feeling. Sorry to yammer on. <laughs> it's all right. You're all right. <laughs> Okay then, so we'll move on to talking about anything we didn't like about the film or anything we would change about the film. Um, don't think there's going to be loads from you here, Alice, but uh, is there anything? Is there anything at all? <laughs> Not really. Like I, I, haven't, I haven't been able to write anything down. The only thing I can think of is, you know, at the end, when they're at the venue and then like Bob Dylan comes on stage mm. and starts singing... That's just framed really weirdly because obviously they want to try and insinuate that it's him but not show his face. So like he's really got his back to the camera and he's doing like a really sort of what looks like a very unnatural stance and unnatural pose to sort of be facing away from the camera. So, you know, oh, yeah, we know it's Bob Dylan, but we can't show you because obviously he's not going to look like him or whatever. And that was it. So mm. I'm hoping you're going to have a couple of things <laughs> and you can maybe balance this out a little bit. And maybe you'll say something and I'll go, oh, yes, terrific point, Josh. I'd never thought about that. <laughs> so go on. Um, give it to me. I think, well, there's a few things. Well, so, so I don't have loads that I dislike about it, but I've, I've written things I think that people might mm -hmm. dislike about gotcha. it. So, for example, this is a general problem with a lot of Coen Brothers films and a lot of other, other comedies of this sort as well, which is the comedy... I think for some people, although I might be doing the general public a disservice here, I think the comedy might be a little bit too subtle. Mm -hmm. So I think some people would. I I remember when I was younger, get picking films up that were called comedies and being like, um, "Where's it's not funny." Yeah. Now the jokes. It, yeah. yeah, it doesn't necessarily. You know, it doesn't have to be laugh out loud, belly aching laughter funny. Mm -hmm. for it to be a comedy but i do think some people would go into a film categorized as a comedy expecting to laugh now mm -hmm. i do laugh at this but it's not like you know it's 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 not you know the way we talk about pop star or rat race or something like mm -hmm. that so i definitely think you could say that about it. it is a little bit slow in one or two places considering it's like what is it like an hour and 45 something like that mm -hmm. so there's i think there's the odd time where it's a little bit um a little bit slow. And the other thing I've, I, I've never really noticed this before is why is Kerry Mulligan's character so angry with him? Oh, she's fuming, isn't she? But I then, thought this. I thought this. She's, she's fuming at him. Yeah. Because either either a something really dark got on there that it never touches on, or b she willingly slept with a guy. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, so I had thought this and I thought about putting it on my list, but by the end I was like, nah, I can't. I just like the film too much. But I did think that because she's she's furious Fucking at him. As livid. If, as livid. if he has impregnated her against her will. There's a, so, there's a, there's like that really say, great line, isn't there, where she says, she says something like, you're like King Midas's worst brother, everything yeah. you touch turns to shit. Yeah, yeah. And it is, it, I remember, I did remember feeling like this is strange how furious she is given that this is what both of them did. But like you say, it, it, it can't just be what we're seeing on the surface. And I think something else has gone on. So it could have been either he took advantage of her in a way that she wasn't happy with. Yeah. Or maybe they were very romantically linked and it was a it was actually very intense and maybe she actually did love him but then mm. he was a dickhead to her or something like that and then obviously we learn that he's done this before yeah. as well with a different woman which again just adds to that th the whole thing of him just never changing like the, you know the film starts and ends with the same scene very within selfish. that yeah and the same yeah. stuff just keeps happening to him he never learns his lesson he doesn't grow as a person he doesn't develop but yeah i did think about that with her i was like something's gone on there that we're I, not I think that it's just I don't I don't think that the, yeah, the dark thing of that they had non consensual sex or anything like that I don't I think it's more that she is angry at the at it the situation and she's yeah. and she's directing all of her anger at him mm -hmm. because it can't possibly be also a little bit her fault yeah and it she's got no one else to cursed, talk to or, is yeah she? yeah he is the only one exactly. she can talk to yeah. about it yeah uh, and also like you say he is. She seems to be seeing him where other people don't see him, which is as being selfish. Mm -hmm. So maybe she's, I don't know, maybe there's an irrational thing in her of like, you're so selfish that your sperm have selfishly got me pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but other than that, no, nothing really. So we'll move on to talking about the critical reception then. Now, I haven't seen the critical reception. I've done my best to avoid it. Now, I know it was fairly well received critically mm -hmm. so you picked this remind me again you've picked this because you think it's a little bit underrated and a little bit underseen yeah and it just it, it seems to be just not considered in terms of great films i think it mm. just doesn't sort of fit in with any of those lists and from what i've read online a lot of people feel that way as well and they feel like oscar isaac was particularly underrated in it too and he does give a fantastic performance in this what would you give it and what do you think it got I think it's a solid eight out of ten. Yeah, I would probably say it got. A, I feel like it might have got about that, but what I can never. It, they're really hard to play, particularly Coen Brothers films, because you you might get one critic who'll give, give it a ten, and another mm -hmm. critic who'll give it a six. So it might balance out. So let's say if I, I'll give it an eight, but let's say it averages out at a at a seven, something like okay. that. So go on then, give it to me. What are the scores? All right then. So. At the time of recording, over on IMDb, it gets a 7.5 out of 10. Okay. And then over on Rotten Tomatoes, the audience give it 74%. And then the critics give it 92%. Wow. <laughs> so so what probably... was that? I get, let's uh, work out the average now. What was the, what was the first one? 7.5? 7 7.5, 74, and then 92. So the audience give it less than the critics. So that averages out at eight, at just above 8 out of 10 or 80%. Okay, yeah. So... Yeah. I would say it is probably oh, like equivalently you know, appropriately rated by the critics, but I'd mm -hmm. say the audience probably underrate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would. For me, eight is just like a tiny bit low. I do okay. think this would be more in like the mid eights for me, like yeah, yeah. eight point five. I think. I think it's just it's a different. It's a different kind of viewing experience in it. And the ways that it is enjoyable are just different to your standard things like, you know, your Marvels and your Disneys and your, you know, big time, massive, you know, CGI extravaganza mm. fest type of directors and all that. It's just, there's just something about it, something kind of deep and nuanced and complex and complicated and all that, that I just, and I, I just thoroughly enjoyed it. So I did... Obviously, I wanted to just talk about it. It was a film that I just wanted to talk about, so I picked it for that reason. But I do think with those scores, it is a, a very tiny bit underrated. And I do think it may possibly be a bit underseen as well. And I think if you're just, if you're into film, if you like films and you like wordy films and, you know, you like nuance and subtext and, and just kind of these sort of 
a personal societal issues that you know get addressed and all that I think this would be oh and if you like music as well there's some <laughs> fucking bangers in this I'll tell you that much so that's my consensus I, I'm, I I'm, I'm willing to give you that I'm willing to give you that so it's underrated particularly by the audience maybe it's not might not it's not critically underrated nah come on not you Sue come on um, nah. but I think it's underrated <laughs> generally speaking and I think it's underseen as well in that sense of the way we've talked about other films in that more people should just see it Well, there we are, Inside Lewin Davis, ever so slightly underrated, but definitely worth a watch, listeners, if you haven't seen that one yet. In the meantime, if you'd like to get in touch with us, it's filmsandthatpod at gmail.com. We're on all the social medias as well. If you search for just films and that, wherever you're on your socials, uh, and we are usually there. And if we're not there, then let us know because we'll set up an account. So we will be mm-hmm. there. Uh, we're also on Patreon as well. So if you fancy supporting us, giving us a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of cash for some extra content and some extended episodes and, uh, you know, early access and stuff like that, then head over to patreon.com forward slash just films and that. It's also linked in the episode description as well. We're also on the television, aren't we, Alice? We are indeed. Every Friday from 6pm, you can find us on the local TV network. So if you live in Birmingham, Bristol, Leeds, Liverpool, or the northeast of England, you can find us on Channel 7 on Freeview. Or if you live in North Wales or South Wales, you can find us on Channel 8 on Freeview. I'm also uploading all the videos to Daily Motion. so if you head on over there and type in Just Films and that, you'll be able to see exactly what it is we're up to. We're talking about all our favourite underrated and underseen films. And sometimes films we just wanted to talk about, like in Southern Davis. <laughs> yes lots of ways to see us hear us engage with us and all that stuff and as ever thank you very much for listening your support does mean a lot to all of us here um uh, we'll see you next week it's goodbye from me cheerio bye